Our theme for the month, as Mike said, is the gift of transformation. We will be exploring transformation from several angles on the coming Sundays from the point of view of how dreams of liberation are born and nurtured until they flower. Sometimes that takes a long time. We'll be looking from the point of view of erasing culturally imposed binaries and from the point of view of spiritual liberation, both personal and communal. Those of you who've been around for a while know that I'm very interested in the history of ideas. I want to know when human beings could have certain ideas and why and what that leads to. What are we capable of thinking at any particular time? And it's less than we sometimes assume. At noon today, our archives committee will be discussing an essay by the first minister of First Unitarian Society. A few months back, Phil Duran back there, who's a member of our archives committee, asked an intriguing question. What's the through line, if there is one thing, that ties together all the ministers and all the congregations that have gathered here at First Unitarian Society? Which is a good question. Is there a through line? And I think that there is. Allow me to offer one little tidbit in terms of the history of ideas. This congregation gathered in 1881, but the term agnostic hadn't been invented yet. Now, a good portion of FUS folks over the years have been either atheist or agnostic, but what were they before the term was invented? That's a good question. What does it mean to the story of this congregation that we developed out of the Minnesota chapter of the Liberal League? Very unlike any other Unitarian or Universalist congregation in the nation. To enter the process, allow me to share with you the nine demands of liberalism. These were issued in 1873 by the Liberal League by the theologian Francis Ellingwood Abbott. Now, I'm not going to read them all, but you can kind of get Reverend Abbott's ideas here by the pamphlet he wrote, The Impeachment of Christianity. <laughs> Number one on the list of the Liberal League was, we demand that churches and other ecclesiastical property shall no longer be exempt from taxes. We demand <laughs> that the employment of chaplains in Congress and in the legislatures, in the Navy and militia and in prisons, asylums, and all other institutions supported by the public money shall be discontinued. We demand that all public appropriations for educational and charitable institutions of a sectarian character cease. Amen. I'll skip down to six, so you're getting the idea here. We demand that the judicial oath in the courts and in all other departments of government shall be abolished. <laughs> See, we still have some agreement here. Um, or number eight, we demand that all laws looking to the enforcement of Christian morality shall be abrogated and that all laws shall be conformed to the requirements of natural morality, equal rights, and impartial liberty. <laughs> I'll read the, yeah, and the ninth one right there at the end, that our entire political system shall be founded and administered on a purely secular basis, and whatever changes shall prove necessary to this end shall be consistently, unflinchingly, and promptly made. <laughs> through lines. One through line is that I think you will have to admit a group that subscribes to those principles are extremely unlikely to become a church. But, but you're in it today. So that's, what the th that's number one through line. You might also realize that these are also the mission of the American Humanist Association, still today. It still is not accomplished today, but the connect line there is that John Dietrich's 
best friend was Curtis Reese, who became the first president of the American Humanist Association. So again, humanism comes out of this congregation. It formed after the Second World War. Now, how did such a thing happen? The Liberal League failed in their legislative agenda, as you see. <laughs> Almost everything they opposed about United States law is still in place 151 years later. How did this happen? One answer is that the Liberal League chapter here in Minneapolis, after their national agenda failed, kept meeting and they formed a study group for Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, which had been published in 1859. And that's a story that's relatively well known. Today I want to look at another through line, a more subtle one, but I think an equally important one to what we're doing today. And it's so subtle that it doesn't even have a name, though we would dare to speak it if it had one. This part of the story begins not in 1859, but in 1836 with the publication in book form of Ralph Waldo Emerson's long essay, Nature. Emerson's boldness got him kicked out of speaking at Harvard for 30 years. One of those very affected by Emerson, Emerson's writing was the American poet Walt Whitman who wrote this, re-examine everything you've been told. Dismiss whatever insults your own soul. That's pretty radical. But I would say it too is a through line in this congregation. It's radical. And it's the essence of a strain of liberalism that leads to us here today. When I took a graduate class on Walt Whitman many years ago, we went through his entire oeuvre I love what the, 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 his entire eve. <laughs> yeah, it ain't gonna do it. <laughs> Without the professor once mentioning that Walt Whitman was gay. Now that's a big thing to leave out of a per person's life who fought for this gay rights all of his life. But it was the dominant American attitude in Whitman's time and it remained true when I was in college. In Great Britain, however, Whitman was seen in his own time as a gay activist. Whitman's greatest disciple was the British activist Edward Carpenter. Now, I hope you've all heard of Edward Carpenter at this point, but if you haven't, I want to teach you a little bit about him today so you can hold on to this wonderful, brilliant man who did change things. Carpenter wrote Whitman a fan letter, and the ending went like this. Because you have given me a ground for the love of men, I thank you continually in my heart, for you have made men to be not ashamed of the noblest instinct of their nature. Fairly open about that. Carpenter emulated Whitman in many ways. This famous photograph of Whitman and his partner, Peter Doyle, who was a Confederate veteran, was not widely known in the United States of the day. You'll notice, I don't know if you can really see it, it says Washington, D.C., 1865, Walt Whitman and his rebel soldier friend, Pete Doyle. <laughs> now, this was circulated among the people interested in the real Whitman, and one of the people who got a copy of that was Edward Carpenter. If you look closely at this photograph of Whitman and his lifelong lover, uh, well, first, Pete, where's your hand? <laughs> now, if you look at Edward Carpenter and his life partner, George Merrill, George's hand is visible and very Victorian, except that was illegal at the time. But they're out and proud, despite the fact that during this time, Oscar Wilde was being hounded to death, right? So this is the basis also of the 20th century novel by the British author E.M. Forster, a novel not published until the 1970s when Forster was safely 
dead. And it became a number one bestseller. Carpenter refused to be invisible, despite the fact that he was being prosecuted, persecuted, etc. He was going to be out and proud. Now, if you look closely at this photograph, you will see that he, uh, Mr. Carpenter adopted a very scandalous form of footwear. <laughs> he introduced to the British public the wearing of sandals, freeing the British foot. But you will also notice his definitive statement on sandals and socks. <laughs> but it's a cold climate, right? As a matter of fact, one of the realities of those days is that there was a convention of never smiling in photographs. So Carpenter and his friends had a really great time never smiling while they were doing incredibly weird things in photographs. Nowadays, we have to smile, right? It's a convention now where you have to be happy all the time. Interesting, isn't it? Well, Google Edward Carpenter, and I think you'll find a lot of very interesting things out there. Carpenter did forego socks in the warmer weather, as a matter of fact. He and uh, his lover often went to Morocco, and so anytime he got in the warm climate, he did take his uh, socks off. So there you go. It's ambiguous. Now, here's a pair of Carpenter's actual sandals preserved in a museum. As you can see, they were not Birkenstocks. <laughs> if you look closely enough, you'll see that they were handmade. And another of Carpenter's great interests was the arts and crafts movement uh, of William Morris. He wanted things handmade and aesthetic, right? Carpenter wrote, every human being grows up inside a sheath of custom which enfolds it as the swathing clothes enfold the infant. Now, these do not look like happy children to me. <laughs> the term swaddling has now been a little bit um, rehabbed, I suppose. But um, I looked it up. Again, I find these things very interesting. Why didn't he say straitjacket? Well, straitjacket <laughs> straight doesn't become a term used in the general population until the 1950s. So really, no one would have known what he was talking about, right? But that's what civilization does to human beings, said Mr. Carpenter, and of course, Emerson and Whitman, etc. Now, a sheath of custom. Uh, a lot of things in this time period had to be coded. You, you, had, you couldn't say what you were saying. So here's your Latin pop quiz for the day. What is the Latin word for sheath? Vagina. <laughs> so, that's where it comes from. So, breaking out of the sheath of custom meant a couple of things for Carpenter. <laughs> also, by the way, in terms of this history of ideas, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's really quite amazing. The, the reason we discovered straitjacket in English, American English, is because women were called into the mental institutions during World War II because the men were gone. And the women said, my God, this is awful. And so prison reform began, and we do have, did have members who did participate in that. So how did R Carpenter's radical philosophy impact what we call religion today? He wrote in, and I love the title, Civilization, Its Cause and Cure, right? <laughs> we find ourselves today in the midst of a somewhat peculiar state of society, he said, which we call civilization, but which even to the most optimistic among us does not seem altogether desirable. Some of us indeed are inclined to think that, is a, a, that it is a kind of disease. Uh, another carpenter quote. Uh, this one from a book called Pagan and Christian Creeds. Today, these taboos and terrors still linger, meaning the things that the Christians were against. Many of them in the form of conventions of morality. 
Conventions is always going to be a bad word for Edward Carpenter. Conventions of morality, uneasy strivings of conscience, doubts and desperations of religion. But ultimately man, capital M, will emerge from all these things free. Familiar, that is, with them all, making use of all, allowing generously for the values of all, but hampered and bound by none. Direct echo of what I just read from Walt Whitman, right? Whatever insults your soul, don't do it. Now, uh, my favorite quote, <laughs> my, my favorite quote from him is, is also theological. Remember the serpent is still living in the Garden of Eden, only the heterosexual couple was expelled. <laughs> you see where he was going with that. <laughs> well, how does that tie into FUS? It's the subject of today's noon presentation, uh, a couple of books by our first minister, uh, Henry Simmons. Our arch archives committee sent out an excerpt this week from the second book that he wrote. This is the first one, which I think, if you look at the, at the, at the year 1882, he came here in 1881. So I very much suspect that these essays are you know, taken from the sermons he was speaking the first year that he was here, I, I would assume. But Simmons said this, Modern thought, with all its destructiveness, has only been enlarging religion. It has swept away the little firmament and the creative week, meaning the book of Genesis, right? Only to find a creation eternal and infinite, and filled us with an order diviner than the Bibles ever told. Bibles being all human scripture, all holy books, it's experience, right? Notice the plural in Bibles. All human scriptures. It's been swept away. It has swept away certain supposed miracles of broken law, but only to show all the world a better miracle of law is unbroken. The world we live in, this material reality, is the good one. Old ideas of deity have indeed been destroyed but only to show the universe pervaded by a power more godlike than the god of theology ever was, more mighty, just, and merciful. A universe pervaded, Simmons says. But this deity is not on a throne somewhere, the white guy in the sky, right? This power is right here, right now, every moment in our world today. Notice that these words are much like Edward Carpenter's, finding after all the long expected savior of the world within his own breast and paradise in the disclosure there of the everlasting peace of the soul. Heaven is here today. Was it an accident that Simmons was quoting Carpenter? I don't think so. These are the statements of people who have jettisoned traditional European religious thinking entirely. Now, I hasten to add that in the 19th century, up until the time of John Dietrich, in the, in the early 20s, the national body, the American Unitarian Association, would not tolerate atheists. If, if you were, became an atheist as a minister, just like the Baptists today, you were out the door. All right. So, Simmons had to be careful if he wanted to be employed. Many ministers of the time found themselves drummed out of the Unitarian ministry. Simmons, by proclaiming a pantheistic, so-called pagan understanding of religion and God, was walking a very thin line in the late 19th century. But the people of FUS here allowed him to do that. Go, <laughs> right, go. What were the practical implications of this way of thinking. Well, every day when I drive from my home in Golden Valley to here, I go through Theodore Worth Park. And I say a little howdy to Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden. Now, Eloise Butler, who lived from 1851 to 1933, was an early member of First Unitarian Society. Like many people who have attended here, she was pushing the boundaries and working the margins. As she once wrote, at that time and place, no other career than teaching was thought of for a studious girl. This is a photo from about two years before she died. This is her 80th birthday photo. Notice there are no men in the picture except one guy up against a tree back there. I'll explain, 
I'll explain that in a little bit. <laughs> Ms. Butler would have been a research botanist, I do not doubt. She, for example, discovered three different species of algae and has those named after her, despite the fact that she didn't have an official professorship. In the Sierra Club magazine a couple of years ago was an article titled, The Women Who Saved Wildflowers. A couple of paragraphs say this. The first wildflower garden in the United States was established in 1907 by Eloise Butler, an algae expert and sister of Cora Pease, a well-known naturalist who connected Butler to a community of women scientists that included Elizabeth Britton and Ellen Swallow Richards, who was the first female instructor at MIT. Now, Butler uh, curated the a Wild Botanical Garden from its founding in 1907 until her death in 1933. Wearing brown coveralls and high-laced black leather boots, armed with a broken-off machete, and wearing a park watchman's star pinned to her chest, she would run out the spooners who might crush her plants. <laughs> Which is still a little outside social conventions. A spooner, that's another word that changes all the time. Spooners, parkers, you know, right. You get the idea. Now, over the gate today and then is this weird sounding phrase. Let nature be your teacher. Now, I don't know how many people even notice that today, but we can assume that Eloise and Henry Simmons knew the rest of the poem. In those days, people memorized poems like that one. And I do believe it reflects Eloise's views on deity. The poem is by the British romantic poet William Wordsworth and was published in 1798. It's considered the beginnings of the British uh, romantic movement. We learned about that a few weeks ago from a BBC thing, right? Remember those romantics. The Tables Turned by William Wordsworth. I want to read just a bit of it for you. Up, up, my friend, and quit your books, or surely you'll grow double. Up, up, my friend, and clear your looks. Why all this toil and trouble? Books, tis a dull and endless strife. Come, hear the woodland linnet. How sweet is music on my life. There's more of wisdom in it. And hark, how blithe the throstle sings. That's a thrush uh, in American English. He, too, is no mean preacher. Come forth into the light of things. Let nature be your teacher. That's the context. And then it goes on. She uh, has a world nature. She has a world of ready wealth, our minds and hearts to bless, spontaneous wisdom breathed by health, truth breathed by cheerfulness. Get, you know, get out and walk, people, right? One impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil, and of good than all the sages can. You're getting the point here, right? Our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous forms of things we murder to dissect. Enough of science and of art. Close up these barren leaves. Come forth and bring with you a heart that watches and receives. That's what Eloise is telling you when you walk through that gate, right? Now, one impulse from a vernal wood, an impulse, an urge, right, that hits you, my, may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good, than all the sages can. That's pantheism, sort of in a nutshell, or something beyond it, as we'll kind of consider next week. Now, take a good look at this photograph. This, the caption reads, Eloise Butler, center, with Henry M. Simmons, an unidentified woman, studying a natural tree graft near Glenwood Springs, circa 1900. Now, I'm not sure if they were actually, if they really, whoever wrote this caption really understood the geography, because as you know, Glenwood Springs is where Oudipils is now, and Eloise is a little bit further over. So I'm not quite sure they know that, but Glenwood Springs, um, had this natural water thing that was going on that becomes this bottled water for a long time, right? Now, notice that the clothing that the women are wearing, it, they're not, that's not exactly conducive uh, to gardening. <laughs> Henry Simmons has his very stylish boater hat on and he's watching. Another convention at the time was that ladies, I suppose women are in the hood, but ladies did not garden without male supervision. Now, 
I assume that the ladies, well, what were they going to do gardening, but it, you know, if, if Victorian, you know, whatever. But I suppose the danger was that they might listen to the throstles singing, right? <laughs> and hark the blithe, the, blithe, the blithe throstle and come into the light of things. I don't know. We can't have women escaping the sheath of custom, can we? <laughs> we can't have whiz, uh, uh, women listening to the thrush's st uh, song instead of the stern preacher's warning. It all appears at first glance to be very milk toast, this little picture. No coveralls, no machete chasing after people. I have a suspicion, however, that Eloise knew just which male to choose to be her overseer for an obviously posed photograph. And he was a preacher to boot. And I have a suspicion most people in town didn't know what he was preaching either, right? <laughs> All very milk toast, very proper, but can't you imagine that they were all saying in their minds, let nature be your, your teacher, with a rather different attitude than the person with the camera probably had. The norm of Unitarian Universalist and Unitarian Universalist congregations has been a slow, often awkward growth into political, social, and theological liberalism. A development out of what Carpenter called the swaddling clothes, the straitjacket of social norms. FUS is not and never has been like that. We started in a different way. Why is FUS uniquely prepared to embrace transgender people and queer philosophy and a new future and realm of liberation? Well, all you gotta do is look back to 1836, 1859, 1873, 1881, 1916, 1964, and the list goes on. Liberation, transformation, I believe, is our through line. Does everyone at FUS know all of this suppressed history? Well, absolutely not, but I believe it is in the DNA of the place. For example, in the 1970s, a group of gay folks met here calling themselves the Invisibles. They were so invisible that we only have a few notes in our archives about that group. But we do know that they were instrumental in establishing the Loring Park Pride Festival. Another attempt at liberation. And I think Edward Carpenter would approve. So thanks, Eloise. Thanks, Henry. And thanks to all the FUS ancestors who bravely broke free from the straitjackets, the sheaths of social norms, reaching out for freedom. Today, we are human as they once were, and we walk the paths that they created. Our duty to them is that we push on so that this congregation is and will remain a transformative place, a beacon of liberation. Thank you.